We'll be back in Hebrews. Hebrews part three. I love this book. I guess Hebrews and Ephesians are about my favorite too. Uh, we've talked the last couple of weeks and if you remember the, this book written to those Hebrews who were they were hearing about Jesus but they wanted to they would go back to the temple they would go back to what was comfortable uh, you know I, for a long time I couldn't figure out you know Hebrews how much of this is for us because we're not Hebrews we're Gentiles but as you go along with this book, we face the same things that the Hebrews did. They had all of this stuff over here given by God, very comfortable. They knew all about it. Been there, doing it for 1,500 years. And now you're asking me to do something completely different, something that's unknown. So it was a tough transition. So we have this book. So it helps us because all of us, the same thing, you know, and I, I hear this all the time. You've not gone this way before. It's unknown. And we as humans, we don't like the unknown. That's difficult. Just give me something I'm familiar with that I know how to do it. And to, but to go into the unknown, I don't, I don't like that. So we looked at last week how he even changed the language. You know, it was in, in prophet, which was in diverse manners, many portions, and and now he, he changed the language to in son, speaks in sons. And we talked about the last days, and, and that was the last days of that way of doing things, the last days of uh, that, that language. Now we're in another language. And you know, those Hebrews, they grew up under the law of Moses, under the feast, the Levitical priesthood, had the tabernacle, the prophets. But it was all shadow. It was, it was all old covenant, but it was, we just don't throw the whole thing out because it was all pointing to the sun, pointing to the new. And so this whole first chapter was, you know, he's better. He's better than angels. Uh, Jesus is better. A greater light has come. A new day has come. And, and so this letter it was written because they kept, they kept going back. They didn't like this unknown territory. So in this first chapter, they're comparing Jesus to angels. You want to know why? I mean, we Paul wrote this out. It's in one little old scripture in, in Galatians. But the law up on Mount Sinai, I know what it says. He talked to uh, uh, God, but, he, but Moses didn't really talk to God. You're saying, well, I've seen the movie. I know he did. Well, uh, that's what... what that's why we get the picture of a mediator. And a mediator so much stands for one. Now, now Paul says this here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? Why are you serving the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained, in the hand, ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So that's why this first chapter starts out with he's better than angels because angels were the mediator. Actually, given the law, they stood there between Moses and God and they were the mediator. You, you see what I mean? So, we've, so if Moses' law came through angels, Jesus is better than angels. You can see why it, it had to be that way. And You know, in our first lesson, we talked about that's initially how God spoke with man through angels. And then, and then that gave way to leadership and prophets and all of that. So this new covenant is not through angels, but through Jesus, who himself is the new covenant. 
So here's the logic behind that. If Jesus is greater than the angels, then the new message is greater than the old message. The new covenant is greater than the old covenant. Now remember, we're talking to people who are over here in the comfort of the old. When I say the comfort of the old, uh, it, it's amazing how our mindsets go. Israel is in bondage 400 years, and they cry to get out. What happens when they get out? They want to go back. They want to get a leader and go back. And, you know, obviously they, they had forgot what they went through down there, but it was comfortable. They knew what they were going to eat, garlics and leeks. They knew... If they didn't make a certain amount of bricks, they would be beaten. That's okay. At least I know what I got coming. That's fine. I'll, I'll take the comfortable. So, so you know, the writer here is he's trying to woo these people out. The same thing today. You, we try to woo people out of the old covenant. And it's very, very difficult because you're asking me to come into the unknown. That's why I love this book of Hebrews. So we pick up having said all that, and then the writer of the Hebrews says, because he's greater, because he's superior, uh, for this reason, we should, we should pay attention to what's being said here. You, you with me? And then he reminds the Hebrews that if you did, did pay attention, what, what happened to you? Look, look at these verses right here. Uh, verse Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. At least at any time we should let them slip. I mean, he's, he's reminded them, you know, pay attention here. Pay attention. And I know what we do with these verses. I've done it all with them. Where we, we come at these verses with law. Like, you know what happened to them under the old covenant, and if you don't get it in the new covenant, it's going to be ten times worse. But he's making this comparison here. Verse 2, For the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Of re, of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The salvation which is today. So he says you you better pay attention because if the word spoken through angels was steadfast. Now what that word means is and, and golly bum I want people to get a hold of this. Steadfast means here it's unchangeable. Now do you get me? So what word is he talking about that was unchangeable? The law. The law that was given to Moses. He said, guys, you know, there was no negotiating with God on this law. Here it was. You don't pay attention to it, what happens? You die. You violate the Sabbath, you die. You don't do this, you die. You mix wool and cotton, you die. You plow with a mule and an ox, you die. It was steadfast. You don't pay attention. There's no going out. There's no ignorance to the law. I can't go out and say, well, gosh, God, I forgot I couldn't put a mule and, a, and an ox together. No, nope, you died. That, that's it. So he says, you paid attention to that. You set up and said, I, don't, I taught my kids early on, don't mix wool and cotton together. Don't put a mule and an ox together. Don't violate the Sabbath. We taught them from two years old on. We paid attention. So he said, if you knew that, how much more you should pay attention to this, this what we're calling great salvation. Great salvation. So you, you see the logic here. The law didn't change. Not a jot or tittle of it changed. It's the strictest thing on the planet. And, it, and Paul said it's holy and it's good. It's unchangeable. You can't modify it. You can't just, and this is what people do today. You can't just take 10 of those laws out. You, you understand what I mean? We're like, well, hey, he changed the covenant, so we only got to keep the 10 now, and we don't have to offer lambs anymore or goats anymore. So we, we no, he said it's steadfast. I mean, this verse here says the law what was given by angels was steadfast. It's unchangeable. 
So you can't come into the church and say, well, guess what? We've decided our Sabbath is a Sunday. Can't do it. You violate the Sabbath, you're gone. I mean, that's it. So you can't say, well, I observe the Sabbath on a Sunday now because that's the resurrection. No, if we want to observe the Sabbath, you've got to keep it on a Saturday, and you better keep all the rules that go with it because if you violate any of those, you've got cotton socks on and a wool sweater, you die. I mean, it's, you, don't, you can't mix it. So if that law was steadfast, and what does the law do? I mean, it's, it's a package deal. It's perfect. All it does is kill. Breaks condemnation and kills. I mean, it's all design. I mean, that's all you get. So he's, he's saying here, because, because of that, I've got a fly in my eye. He's writing to these Hebrews saying, look at your forefathers. Look at, look at what they endured. Look how they respected the law of Moses. And they did. So how much more should you respect this new message? This new great salvation? But that's what Jesus called it. Do you remember we, we had the lesson on B.C. or A.D. and we talked about the word uh, uh, neos, which was new, like a new car, you know, or kainos, all together new. Because Jesus called it, look, he said, a new commandment I give you. That doesn't mean we got to keep 11 now. That means a new altogether other than those over there. This is altogether different. A new commandment I give you. New, canos, all together, not like the old, new and kind. Because you can't mix the new and the old together, can you? I mean, Jesus said, look, you can't put new wine in old bottles. I mean, you can't take a piece of the old coat and sew it in the new one. I mean, are you crazy? You can't do that. Doesn't work. The writer of the Hebrews says, a new covenant I give unto you. The, the prophet Jeremiah prophesied of it, a new covenant. Not like the ones your fathers had. Wasn't like that one. This ain't merging the two together. A new commandment I give you. So the whole point is we can't be in, in the place of altering the law. The law was steadfast. I wish people could get that part. You cannot alter the law. It cannot be changed. We can't try to make it more comfortable. It's there. You, you know what I mean? What, what's the word? Palatable? Let's just, okay, we're, we're in the 21st century now. Let's try to make the law a little bit easier on everybody. You can't. It's unchangeable. You can't make it easier to obey. It's the ministration of death. That's it. Galatians says if you're under the law, you're under a curse. Because cursed is everyone who doesn't do, doesn't obey everything written in the book. You know, I spent some time on that phrase, written in the book. The, the, the whole law, the book. I mean, he's talking about the whole law of Moses here. He, you know, he's not talking about the Ten Commandments given in Exodus. He's talking about the whole thing. So we're really up the creek because really if you sin and you want to pay for it, you can't come up here and pay for it. you got to go to Jerusalem to an altar over there at the temple. And guess what? The temple's gone. The altar's gone. You're really up the creek if we're going to obey the law. There's no more sacrifice. I mean, we're, you, you see, we're kind of left in a pickle here because this law was so strict. God knew what he was doing when he had them tear down that temple because he knew they wouldn't stop going to it. The book of the law. Now, James says the same thing. Uh, you know, if you're going to keep the law and you, you break one, you're guilty of the whole thing. So be very careful if you want to start talking law. Be very, very careful. Because all you're going to do is, is increase sin, increase death, increase condemnation. That's, that's all you're going to do. So it's not just give me the 10 or give me the 9 or give me the 11. I've heard it all three ways. Can't, can't do that. So if you're under the law, you're under the curse. If you're under the new covenant, you're under incredible blessing. I mean, which, which do you want? Curse or blessing? Duh. 
That's the whole point of this book of Hebrews, is to argue them away from the old. I mean, really, I mean, that's like, uh, hey, would you like a pile of dirt for supper or a giant T-bone steak? Amazing to me, and you think how silly, amazingly, people would take the dirt. Incredible blessings in the new. So he's trying to urge them, argue them away so that they will, will grab a hold of the new. Now, if the old was unchangeable and every transgression and every sin got a penalty, a just recompense, uh, what, what I mean, you know, we go through the law, this deserves this, this deserves this, you know, I mean, he goes through the whole thing, you know, if you find a sheep falling in a ditch and you don't pull it out, or if it's neighbors and you find a dead body, and uh, I mean, just everything is, this deserves this, this deserves that. But today we alter that law, we try to, and I, you know, Again, Hebrews is right there. It's steadfast. You, you can't alter it. So we say, well, I'm going to keep the 10. I'm going to move the Sabbath over here to a Sunday. And plus, I like sausage, and I'm not giving up my sausage. You can't do that. If you're going to keep the law, you can't eat none. You can't eat pork. Uh, sorry about your shrimp. You can't eat shrimp no more. All that's gone. You can't do it. The law is unchangeable. The penalty for not keeping Sabbath is death. So today we like to, to uh, um, we take the Sabbath, but we don't want the penalty. We say, I'll take that verse, but I don't want that verse, you see. So we pick and choose through the law, altering it to make it more comfortable. So that we can be justified. You remember Paul just finally stood up and said, Not having mine own righteousness. I get rid of all of it. Now he was a Pharisee. In other words, he was a number one law keeper on the books. That's what it meant. So we can't pick and choose which laws we want to make it more comfortable, to make it easier. The whole message here of Hebrews is... Uh, it, this is the whole message of the new. It's, it's not that we go back and try to adapt the old and somehow change it so that we can do it. But we abandon it. We let it go. Get rid of it and get and grab a hold of the new. Now let me read this again. For the word spoken by angels was steadfast, unchangeable. Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. The penalty was there. Every sin received its just punishment. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? He's saying, basically, if you respected that, Hebrews, my gosh, you need to respect this. That one came with a curse and death, and this one is full of incredible blessings. You had respect to that. Did you, you see the logic here that he's making this comparison. God also bearing them witness, I'm in verse 4, both with signs and wonders, divers, miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now, here's a, a side note. Uh, I know the two chapters of Hebrews that were always held over my head, Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 6. I've heard this, and, and this is the argument for people when they say you can lose your salvation. It says if we keep on sinning after that we have received... Uh, you know, then there's no more sacrifice. And I, gosh, that was told me all the time. No more sacrifice, which means you have to pay for it. Hebrews chapter 6. Having tasted of the powers of the age to come, went back. It's, it's impossible to, to bring them on. So it's like, well, see, they, they once were church members and they backslid and now it's over. They lost their salvation. They're out. 
One thing I, I like to teach people is when you're reading the scriptures, you always have to keep it in context. You can't take it out of context. It's, it's context. So if we look back from Hebrews chapter 10, we look back from Hebrews chapter 6, God is providing the context right here. It's, it's, it's not people who, who got saved. It's people who neglect salvation, period. You, you understand? I'm comfortable over here. Yeah, Jesus, I, I, yeah, okay. I'm staying right here. They neglected this whole thing of salvation. They, they, they they just don't want nothing to do with it. I'm comfortable over here. Why you want to mess with my comfort zone? It says, in fact, they've tasted other powers of the age to come. Uh, you know, that's what Hebrews 6 and 10, you know, they tasted it. I mean, think about this to, at the Hebrew time. I mean, they got the best teachers in the world. They got the apostle. Can you imagine hearing Peter? Really? Paul? Matthew, man, I mean, come on. That'd be pretty awesome to go to a church and have Peter preaching today, wouldn't it? I mean, you know, they, they, they heard these, their own brothers, Hebrews. The best of the best get the best doctrine. They tasted it. Then they fall away. They neglect this great salvation. They went back to the law, which... They remain under the curse. They tasted other powers of the age to come. Uh, so how does this verse put it right here? Look, God also bearing them witness with both signs and wonders and miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost. And you still neglected it? I mean, think about that. All these wonderful things, and you still neglected it. So they 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 tasted, but you know, I, I, I think of a of a kid, you know, you put something in their mouth and they don't like it, and they, you know, and they just spit it out. Well, that's what happened here. I mean, they they might have participated, they might have come to some. Uh, heard some teaching. They might have participated in some Christian activity, but they they never take it in Jesus as as Christ, their Lord and Savior. That's what this verse was warning about right here. The the entire book, really. I mean, I mean, he's saying this is the greatest message on the planet here. And if you miss it, if you neglect it, there's nothing left but condemnation. That, I mean, that's what he's saying. There, if you miss this. I mean, this is the greatest message on the earth. There's nothing else. Verse 5 and 6, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak? But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man thou art mindful of him, or the son of man thou should, that thou visited him? I mean, he's... He's quoting Old Testament Psalms here. And again, comparing Jesus with angels. And you keep in mind, this is the Hebrews. So if you're a Hebrew, you get this. You, you, you see, because, I mean, they knew were how the angels and uh, with Samson's parents and uh, Abraham and, and Lot and Moses. They, they knew. So, I mean, they Hebrews got it. Uh, to them, angels wasn't like what we see on TV shows and all them uh, things. They, they got it. But he's, he's saying here, don't mix a message through angels with a message through Jesus. You, you don't compromise grabbing a little bit of Moses and a little bit of Jesus. Thinking you get a nice marriage of doctrinal beliefs. I'm going to take some of Moses. I'm going to take some of Jesus. I'm going to take some of this. I'm going to blend it all together and, and make our church laws and doctrines. Because, you know, and this is what people think. We'll get into this argument here in a few minutes. They think, okay, we can preach grace up to a point. 
And then we got to bring some law in there because if we don't, you'll miss it. You'll mess it all up. And you'll be a backslider. And you'll be all the other things that they call people. Uh, radical grace, just mm, it's too much. I mean, Paul said the, the law kills. The Spirit gives life. How can you mix life and death? You can't take, well, I'm going to put a little death in the pot, a little life in the pot, stir it up. Uh-uh. Basically, all you've got with that is death. You know, you take a little, little bit of poison and put it in the pot. All you got is death. Now, keep in mind here this, this mixture. Now, I want to give you a verse. I bet you've never heard it put this way before. In James chapter 1. And y'all know James here, the epistle of James. He's, he's the Lord's uh, younger brother. Obviously, Jesus was first one, but he's, he's the oldest. He was the uh, uh, a bishop of the church of Jerusalem, I believe, for about 30 years. This, that's the James I'm talking about right here. And James, I, I want to throw this out there, James struggled. I mean, we think these apostles just got it. They struggled just like us. I mean, here's Peter and them, and they struggled letting go of the old, just like we do, every one of us. I was, I was talking to my uh, dear friend this morning. I said, when I came out of Primitive Baptist, I didn't know what to do uh, because we had a certain way of doing things, the way we sung, the way we did it, the way we prayed, and I felt lost. It was unknown. I didn't know how to do it. So you, you want to go back to that familiar because I will hear, man, I'm uncomfortable. I don't, I don't know. And, you know, we as humans, we don't like the I don't know. James struggled. He struggled coming out of, of law over here. You would think, why would we struggle coming out of law into grace? Well, it's, it it's, sounds too good to be true, uh, for one thing. But here's what James says in verse 6. But let him ask in faith. Not wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double minded man is unstable in all of his ways. I know you've heard that verse. Every time we pray and we don't get a prayer answered, well, maybe you was double minded. Remember, James was a Hebrew. Okay? All these apostles here were Hebrews. Do you know what James is saying? James is saying the same thing the Hebrew writer is saying. We can't mix the old with the new. If I try to earn something with God, uh, if I want to mix law, I mean, look what he says. Ask in faith. I mean, that is radical compared to law. Now we're over here in faith, and you remember they were kept in bondage of the law until faith came. So there was no faith under the law. Right? I mean, there was no faith. So now James is wanting us to get completely away. That's why he says, get it completely away, asking in faith, and then he's comparing everything else over here to law. Tossed to and fro because what happens when we're under law and we're praying? Oh, I don't know if God hears me. Maybe I've sinned. Maybe the heavens are brass. It, it, all of, uh, so all of these doubts and then what happens we pray and even if we feel good about our prayer five minutes later the old devil but, but you know last week what you did how do you think God is going to and then, oh, so I'm never going to think I deserve anything because the law is always going to condemn me away from it so he says a double minded man a double mind, I ask a lot of people what does double minded mean well it means I'm thinking about fishing and then I'm trying to pray now what James is saying is double minded law and grace you can't be double minded it's either if you want the law have it or it's all grace ask in faith because if you're asking over here you're not going to receive anything you won't even expect to because it'll condemn you, which is what it's supposed to do. So I just wanted to throw that out so you would get a 
an ideal of double-minded. And, and keep in mind, we are dead to the law. We're not supervised by the law. The, the schoolmaster's gone. We don't need the schoolmaster anymore. Now let me read some more. Verse 7. Thou made him a little lower than the angels, crowned him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands, and you put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he hath put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Let's consider these verses. First, the Son of God, we know this is talking about Jesus, the Son, was willing to humble himself. He was willing to be humiliated on a cross. Remember, he, he, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So that he might taste death for every man, that he might taste death for you, that he might taste death for me. Jesus tasted death. i got to get right down to the bare bones here. He's telling the Hebrews. He's telling me. He tasted death for me. We're going to see a word here in, in a few minutes, but a word that we've talked about before. Propitiation. Now, in the King James, it doesn't use it, but it does in the NAS. I don't know. Does anybody have a New American Standard? It might have it in, in yours, but uh, I didn't bring my New American Standard, but it, it's the word propitiation. And the word propitiation here, it means to satisfy a deity, right? I mean, that's what the word means, to satisfy a deity. God is satisfied through the finished work of Jesus Christ. I wish people could get a hold of that. Remember, we talked about that in our study on 1 John. Throughout human history, people try to satisfy a deity. Whatever, whatever God they think. And, you know, there's many different peoples around the world uh, in all kinds of ways. They try to satisfy their deity. It might be dancing around the campfire. You know, I mean, that's what they know. So they're, they're trying to satisfy a deity. They might be offering children. They're trying to satisfy a deity. They might be lifting up songs. They might be at a wailing wall. You've heard of the wailing wall? They might be there. They're trying to satisfy a deity. Somebody, their God, who they think is upset and needs to be propitiated. So they're doing something trying to, to uh, propitiate, to satisfy their deity. They're, tr they're trying to get clear. They're trying to get clean. They're trying to... Maybe reach a state of nirvana. They're, you know, people meditate. And they, oh, if we can just do this so long, if we can fast so long, if we can do this so long, then we can reach this state. Christians try to do the same thing. We try to reach this state. So whatever it is, ever whatever kind of function they do, they've been trying to propitiate or trying to satisfy a deity. Now what this verse is saying right here, verse 9, what this verse is saying to every Hebrew, every Gentile, every person reading this, it's saying, stop. He's saying stop. You don't have to perpetuate your deity any longer. You can stop now. You can rest. I mean, just, just think about that. I mean, to the Hebrews. Maybe who they're hearing this and they're leading their lamb up or their goat up or they're going up to the Day of Atonement and they, they hear this. You can let your lamb go. You don't have to do that anymore. Because really, all God wanted was one thing in exchange for everything that we've done. God required one thing. Death. Right? I mean, that's, that was the requirement. The law was steadfast. Unchangeable. It says death.
And you know what? You and me can even offer that to God. We can offer our death to him. People try to do it every day. Take up your cross. And they try to offer a death for him. But it's insufficient. It's not worth anything. Because everything that God values, he gives to us in his son. So it says here, Jesus, by the grace of God, Jesus should taste death for every man. But here's the, here's the other side of that coin now. We don't really think we deserve death. They might. The guy who did that, he might. But us, come on, we're raised in good conservative families. You know, good values. We, we went to school. We did our homework. You know, we didn't do this. We didn't do that. And you're telling me I deserve death? I don't think so. Never killed anybody. So we settle for a lesser punishment for our sins. We, we know that we sin. We don't really think we deserve death, but so we'll settle for a lesser. We'll, we, so we settle into the, uh, into the idea that God would maybe, you know, he's not going to kill me, but maybe he can make me sick, you know. I got the flu, and that was because, I don't know if you guys ever was around in any, any of that, but... I, uh, you know, I know uh, a guy one time is in a car wreck and uh, broke about three ribs right there. And we knew why he was in the car wreck. He sinned. I don't know who the lady was that hit him. I don't know what her crime was. Tore her all to pieces, the vehicles up. But, you know, we'll settle for a lesser punishment. Car wreck, a few broke ribs, kidney stone. Maybe, maybe God calls me to lose a job. Have you ever heard that? You know, well, you sin and God, you know, he caused you to lose your job. Maybe caused turmoil in your family. You know, y'all, you've been doing right, so God had to get your attention, so he had to come down, and you know, he's busting y'all up in your family, causing your kids to go crazy. So now what have we done? I mean, that's why we had to make the statement, God is not the author of confusion. He's not the author of sin. But dad God, if we don't believe he is. So we, we look at all the circumstances. We look at all the consequences of, of the world around us and we ascribe all of that to God. So we run around. Now think how ludicrous this is. So we run around with a God who has paid for our sins and we'll say, amen, brother. But he's still punishing us in small ways for our sins. He loves me, but it's, uh, I guess, a lesser love. He loves me, but he's really frowning at me. I mean, have you ever felt that way that God was upset with you? I mean, have you ever just felt like that God says, I messed up with you, big boy. You, whew, so upset with you today. And, and I, so I get in my mind, I, I believe that God is irritated with me. I believe that. God is sitting up there saying, I can't believe you continue to do that same stupid thing over and over. Because that's what really gets you. Angry. I mean, sometimes you do one sin and, and then all of a sudden that's overdone with. But do you got anything that you do stupid on a regular basis? I got some that I do all the time. Can't help it. It's like, God, how do I keep doing that? And then, so we get this idea that God is just like, I can't believe you did that again. I'm so upset with you. And he's frustrated. He's got a, he's got a big frown on his face because of my performance. Well, he's telling us right here, here's God's economy. Here's God's economy. You know, I, I can't go to the store anymore and, and pay for uh, you know, whatever. I can't go to the gas station and get 10 gallons worth of gas and give them a chicken. It don't work that way anymore. There's an economy out there. An economy says you got to have some coin, some cash. God's economy is not a frown. Sickness is not adequate. Not an adequate punishment. The only adequate punishment for our sin is death. It's the death penalty. And you know what? all the punishment for our sin and put it away 
uh, there's no punishment left, right? God is satisfied. In other words, he's propitiated. God is satisfied, meaning he ain't frowning. Jesus tasted death for you. He tasted death for me. He tasted being out of fellowship, right? My God, my God. I mean, he tasted it so you and I would not have to. God doesn't have anything to do with our lesser punishments. But we got to be honest here. This is the way we feel. We feel, we feel this about other people. I mean, you ever walk into a room and you feel like somebody's mad at you? I mean, you, 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 just, you get to sense. Here we are. You get to sense, man, something ain't right. And you go over to the person and you say, man, I'm sorry if I uh, offended you. And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. But I feel like, I feel like you're mad at me. So, our, our, so what has happened in the church world, especially what has happened in the church, our feelings have become the indicator for truth. Not truth itself, not the written word that says you're clean. I don't feel clean. Well, the word says you're clean. Well, I don't feel clean. So I need somebody to make me clean again. You see, what he's saying here is don't neglect this great salvation. I mean, you gave heed to this law, and now you're going to let your feelings come in the middle of this and say, but I don't feel good today. And you know how you know you know the feeling that we're most used to? Shame. And shame is so powerful. We grow up in shame. It's so powerful that we can manipulate people to do whatever we want to do with shame. That's why it takes this great, mighty work, this great salvation of God, because shame started all the way back in the garden. And you and I were born in shame. And then every time we've messed up, it's grew and it's grew and it's grew. And now our feelings are all wrapped up, masking the shame. But the truth is, as I've believed on Jesus, as I've received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I'm translated out of that. People don't believe this. People don't believe it. I'm translated out of that into the kingdom of his dear son. But people say, but I don't feel it, so it's not true. So again, what are we doing? We're neglecting this great salvation. I mean, people will argue with me. We're not in the kingdom yet. Well, I don't know. Well, let's just throw the book of Colossians out because it says we are. I mean, I don't know what you do. with Well, I don't feel it. Sorry about it. I mean, we've been translated out of death into life. I don't feel it. We've been translated out of darkness in, into light, out of Adam into the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll say this. We'll say, well, that's great for eternity. All right, we got saved. That's great. One day going, going to heaven. That's great. But from this day forward, I'm going to live out of my feelings. And today I feel distant from God. Today I feel like the heavens are brass. Today I feel like I really need something to do something to get God stirring up again. God has left me. And I know why he left me, because of sin. And, and, you know, today I'm having a bad day and I feel so punished. I feel God is so frowning at me. I feel like God is upset with me. I mean, we've all felt that. I mean, I've wanted, I can remember beginning on my face and begging and begging and begging. And you know what? All of that's old covenant. You know why? Because God wasn't propitiated at that time. But he's saying he tasted death. <laughs> he tasted death for every man. You, you can rejoice. You, do you see? I mean, this is such so fantastic, but it, it's so boring. Because really, we're so used to our feelings, and our feelings have been mostly controlled by shame. That's why shame doctrine is so powerful over and over. We're suckers for emotional truth. We are. We, we live out of the soul and not spiritual truth. I can remember... Just at a meeting one time, you know, I've told you this before, upon Pilgrim's Rest, and I thought this was the pinnacle. 
of, of a meeting. I didn't think it could get any higher. Uh, than, than what it was. And you know what? As far as that kind of meeting goes, I would say that was probably the highest. It was the pinnacle. But God showed me something else. That that pales in comparison to this new one. I, I can't explain it because I wished I could. I wished I wasn't such a stinking brute sometimes. I can't explain it when I want to say this is so much better. But people's like, no, we want this. I'm like, well, when you get, you know, I, 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 this guy, I guarantee I could call him right now and put him on speakerphone. I would never do that. I could put him on speakerphone. How you doing, brother? Peaks and valleys. That's the way he answers. All the time, peaks and valleys. You know what I mean. Peaks and valleys. Some days is good. Some days is bad. Why is that? Because I'm living out of my soul. And you know what? Some days is good. Some days the sunsets are beautiful and the sunrises are beautiful. Some days it's rainy and dreary and gray. And I feel so distant from God. We're suckers. Our soul and our emotions are beautiful. Listen, nothing wrong with your emotions. God gave them to you. I'm not saying be a, a clone robot over here. Emotions are beautiful. But they're to be brought in line with spiritual truth. And when they come in line with spiritual truth, it's so much greater. I can't explain it. I'm just... But all those thoughts, all those, all those wild thoughts we get, the, the purpose of us having a, a, a spirit, a spirit has been born again, born from above. New spirit cries, I have a father. The reason we have a spirit is so that we can comprehend spiritual truth because he said you'll never get this because it, it's not for the soul, it's not for the flesh. But I'm going to give you this new spirit so that you can comprehend this and then you can, by the renewing of your mind, by the renewing of your soul, emotions, you can bring that in line with the spiritual truth. And, and when this, then it begins to reprogram, if you will, our soul. Renovate, make new. But most of the time we live out of the soul. We're, we're used to it. So we say, Jesus tasted death for me, but I feel distant and God is mad. So we could ask the question, so what makes you feel distant from God? What's the answer going to be? My sin. Because that's what's preached all the time, right? Sin, 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 sin. And you know you sin and you're distant from God because that's how you feel. But then I ask the question, so what did God do with your sins? Well, he put them away as far as the east is from the west. Amen. Does he remember your sin anymore? No, he doesn't. I mean, hallelujah, praise the Lord. But he's still mad at me. Why is he mad at me? Because of my sin. Duh. You see what I mean? That's what we So we engage in this religious double talk. We will accept payment for our sins for heaven. Right? We'll do that. All right. Got me a place over there because it's over there. But not for daily living. That's too much grace. We don't want too much grace. I don't want, I would rather live in the peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, up and down, up and down. And plus, you know what it says it was a stumbling stone? I'm going to give you some good English right here. It's offensive to our ego. We get right down to it. We want to pay for our sin. Somehow or another, we want to do something to propitiate God. We, I mean, we to say God is satisfied in the finished work of Jesus Christ and I can't add nothing to it offends me. I've got to be a missionary. I've got to preach. I've got to do something to make God happy with me. To say that he's already happy with me, he's already perpetuated, and there's nothing I can do. He's just head over heels in love with me. Time out, God, to hold up and let me, let me earn this thing. You, you see, I mean, it's crazy. There's nothing you can do about your sins. You can't make up for them. You, you can't change and get God to erase your past because you changed and get God to do something because you changed. I read in there, leper can't change the spots anyway. There's nothing you can do about your sins except say, Jesus, thank you. That's what you can do about them. Thank you. They're forgiven. They're gone. As far as the east is from the west, it's finished, it's over. That's what you can do. 
And one of the things that, that we do, we do here every Sunday when the guilt comes in, and it does, you, you guys know it, the guilt comes in, the, the distant feelings come in, the, the brass heavens, that those feelings, those emotions, they come. We can do one thing when they come. It's what we do every Sunday. Do this in remembrance of, of, of Him. Do this in remembrance of me, He said. I can remember. And you know what remember is? The power of that is present now. Wait a minute. He tasted death. We can remember what He did. Now listen. What He did was 2,000 years ago. Before you were even born. It was done. Before you were even born, you were forgiven. You were born in a state of forgiveness. Oh, man. Oh, people don't like that. So we'll say, uh, I'm telling you, remember what God did, what God did through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, not what God will do. Why do I say that? Because everybody tells me what God is about to do. And I say, you guys missed it by about 2,000 years. We remember what he did. Do you, I mean, you see? Because if the work ain't finished, then God's still got to move and do something. But if the work is finished, then I read in this book that he sat down because the work was finished. You, you can't get closer to God. You know, if you do something and you... I know in the Old Testament they had to fast and pray and offer and do all of those things. And, I mean, it's there. Do you realize you can't do that and get closer to God anymore? Why? Because you're in Him. How can you be any closer than one spirit with the Lord? I mean, how can you? What can you do? Nothing. Except say, Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You're one spirit with Him. You, you are already seated at the right hand of God in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How can you get any closer? We need to bring our soul in line with spiritual truth. So we can, we can, we can say all day, we can do all, all, all these things, try to perpetuate God, but, and we can pray all day, I want to get closer to God. Imagine how that... Imagine how that is. I mean, that would be like Nevaeh said, Oh, I want you to be my mommy. I really want you to be my mommy. And you'd be like, Girl, what's the matter with you? It, I mean, you would. So, I mean, we pray a lot of stupid prayers. I want to get closer to God. I really want to get closer to God. I've heard, oh, man. I'm like, Come on. You know, we're praying, Oh, Jesus, I've sinned. Come clean me. And so, you know, that was a great prayer. David prayed that prayer. Created me, O Lord, a clean heart. But we pray it. Created me, Lord, a clean heart. Guess what? 2,000 years ago, created in you a new heart. So I don't have to pray that prayer anymore. I can look back at David. I can look back in the Psalms in the midst of his sin, and, and I can go, whew. Man, that was a mess. And I might be in the same mess and I can say, Hallelujah. I ain't got to pray that prayer no more. I ain't got to say, Create in me a clean heart anymore. Oh God, I've sinned. Because he's perpetuated. It's, he tasted death for every man. You see, I mean, this is too much grace for people. It is. It's too much grace. People won't have it. It's too much grace. So either I can, I can ask for what I already have Oh, God, please create in me a clean heart. Huh? Or I can rest in what I already have. Big difference. Big difference. Now, with what I'm saying here, people think, well, going that way, going that approach will lead to a sin fest. You know, all this grace, no more law. People will just go crazy, sin. I believe God knew what he was doing when he said new covenant. I believe he knew what he was doing. He didn't say, oh, I didn't think of that. I mean, I do a lot more stupid stuff when I feel rotten, don't you? But when I feel clean, I do a lot better. 
So I might have to come back to this a hundred times a day and remind myself of what the Lord has done and think on Him. I mean, it's, it's crazy to think that God making us totally forgiven would cause more sin. I mean, God's not stupid. I mean, look, look what Peter says. Let's just flip over here to Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. You, you know, he's talking about all these uh, attributes here. Diligence, uh, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, uh, kindliness, charity. All of those things. And then verse 9 he says, but he that lacketh these things is blind. And then he says, and cannot see afar off. And hath forgotten he was purged from his old sins. So he says, if you lack these things, I mean, I'm looking at myself and I see lack. And what Peter says is you're blind. <laughs> I hate to tell you guys, you're blind. And you've forgotten you were purged. He didn't say you need to be purged again and have another fast and a new session and get it all going again. He says you forgot you've already been purged. And if you remember our lesson last week in Hebrews, in chapter 1, verse 3, when he had by himself purged our sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And that word for purged was uh, that word that's used in the cleaning of lepers. You know, lepers that had to go around saying, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. When we become believers, we get a new heart. We get a new mind. And, you know, here's one of the things people don't get. Once that happens, it almost, it's, it's like a civil war goes off in you. You know, before it was okay, you didn't care, but now all of a sudden you care. You, you don't want to sin anymore, but you do. So you get stuck in Romans 7. No good that I would, I do not. I'm trying, I'm trying my best, but I'm, I'm in this loop. My emotions are going every which way. And you're wondering, where is all this coming from? I didn't have this struggle before. What's going on? So what we do is we go around hanging out in church groups and to see if we can try to figure out how to stop sinning. And their conclusion is, you need more law. You didn't know what sin was, so I'm going to give you more law. Ah, oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Now, now I can say, well, your hair is not right, and your dress is not right, and your earrings are too long, and so I can bring in more law. Ah, uh -huh, we've got it figured out. We forgot to read Peter says, uh, you guys forgot what you need to do is sell them or clean. Tell them they've already been purged, that Jesus has tasted death for every man. So we, we try to figure out with, you know, all the rededications, everything that goes on, we try harder and harder and harder. I've heard people say, well, you need to try harder. Well, we know there's something inside of us, and we don't want to do that. So that's why that we do try harder. That's why we're emotional suckers, because we don't want to feel that way. We don't want, so we will try anything. Any preacher tells us to do anything, we'll do it. It doesn't matter. But God is not naive in making us totally forgiven. He wasn't naive. He wasn't naive in giving us a, a brand new heart. It's from that heart that we live. I mean, what did Jesus say? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. And as soon as I give you rest, it's up to you. From here on out, it's up to you. You better not mess it up. If you do, I'll be ticked. A minute ago was, come unto me. Oh, you the laborer. So we come unto him. And now let me tell you. I mean, the scripture says, just as you've received him, so walk in him. We go out. I mean, we've talked about this before. We go to an unbeliever and we offer total forgiveness to an unbeliever. Do we, do we not? Doesn't matter. If they're murderers on death row, we offer Jesus Christ will forgive you from all your sin. Totally. But then I want you to know, uh, new convert, you, once you come into Christ, you're going to feel up and down. You're going to feel lost. You're going to feel different. Uh, God's going to be mad at you. You're
You lose your salvation. You're going to have to come and beg forgiveness. I mean, before it was total forgiveness, but now if you don't ask for forgiveness, oh, you are up the creek. You're going to be punished. you got to figure out what would Jesus do in every situation. you got to try your best, and I'm going to tell you, you're probably always going to fail, and you're going to feel like dirt all the time, but uh, are you ready to become a Christian? No, we sell it. Jesus plus nothing. Don't. We sell it. Jesus plus nothing. Because we know, really, that's all that works. A heart that's, that's humble, that's hungry, that's craving something. They don't even know what they're craving. We know it's Jesus plus nothing. And then we come, we come to Christ and we get upset because it's still Jesus plus nothing. But I want to add something to it now. I mean, there's only one message that changes our character. It's the message that brought us salvation. Jesus plus nothing. I mean, do we tell the new converts, all your sins are forgiven, but now you've got to ask for every single one, and what if you forget one? Maybe you should play the, pray the blanket prayer, forgive me for all my sins. You know, you ever pray the blanket prayers? I mean, do we really believe Jesus took away all of our sin, past, present, future? And the truth of the matter is, it's not about our memory. It's not about our confession. It's about His cross and about His blood. And that's it. And once we get a hold of that, we got a dangerous gospel on our hands. The gospel's lost all of its danger, all of its power. It's too watered down. We... And I know, I mean, just the way people word things. We, we get them into Christ and it's Jesus plus nothing. And, and we water it down and say, now uh, Jesus is, uh, he's going to help you. You know, when you try, he'll try. Y'all can work together. That's not the gospel. Just as you received him, walk in him. He tasted death so we wouldn't have to taste death. He became sin for us so that we would never be dirtied by sin again. Let me, let me keep on going here. Verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things, by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation. Perfect through suffering. We just saw Jesus as priest. Now we're going to see Jesus as counselor. I mean, as priest... Uh, that's good, our sins are forgiven, but now how are your, how's your life really changed? Because he's, he didn't leave, he didn't do a priestly thing and go away. He lives in you and he's the greatest counselor in the whole world. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's called the comforter. I'm not going to leave you. I mean, he said, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm just not going to pay for your sin and I'm out of here. <laughs> the greatest counselor in the whole world is going to live in you. So, th so this is awesome. To, that he might make perfect, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Man, we could spend a month right there. He's not ashamed of you. No matter what you've done, what you're doing, he's not ashamed of you. And we're brothers with Jesus. And he's not ashamed of us. I mean, do we ever just let that sink in? I mean, he prayed there in John 17, Father, the glory that you've given to me, I've given to them, that you might love them even as you love me. He's shared his glory with us, and he's not ashamed of us. And you said, well, you know, sometime. No, he's never been ashamed of you. I don't imagine that. Even in your worst day, never ashamed. We say, well, you know, but I sin. See, it's not about sin. It's about the blood of Jesus Christ. Sometimes you've got to ask, when will we ever get over ourselves? We count our sins and we weigh our sins and, and the balances. God doesn't look at any of that. He doesn't look at our sin or weigh our sins in the balance. He's got the one economy. He tasted death for every man. Jesus' work is finished. 
where sin did abound, grace did more much, much more abound. I mean, we've got to come to the fact that all of our sin is small and God is big. I mean, really, we've got a big God. Well, we don't really feel that way. He's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. Not ashamed. Verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again will I put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. What is it? Proverbs says, Blessed is the man whose quiver is full. Has lots of kids. Jesus is saying, My quiver is full and I'm so satisfied. And you know what Jesus is satisfied with? You. Because God gave us to Jesus as a gift. You know, we talked about that. And God doesn't give ugly gifts. He told us. God doesn't give ugly gifts. So Jesus is completed. What he said, I mean, we, we can't believe it when, when God said, Jesus, I'm giving you Jim Moore. And he just turned and flips. This is awesome. And we're saying, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute, Jesus. I'm a mess. I've already took care of it all. I've already took care of it all. Right? And he runs around and he yells out, this is my brother. I mean, he goes, he says, I'm going to go sing. I'm going through the crowd, and I'm just so proud. He goes to like a football game, and I just think of somebody walking up, and he said, this is my brother right here. Hey, uh, this is my brother right here. And we, we're thinking, oh, dirty face, I ain't dressed right. No, this is my brother right here. This is Jesus to, uh, bragging on us. He's not ashamed to call us brethren or sisters. I mean, we don't think about ourselves as being a gift to, to, to Jesus from God. And he's pleased, well pleased to have us. I mean, just maybe, just maybe we really are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Just maybe. Just maybe we're, we are valuable and cherished. But God himself, I mean, imagine that. I thought we had to do something to earn it. I thought he was upset today. I thought God was upset because, man, I really blew it. And he's, <laughs> there's no flies in the ointment here. It's done. It's finished. He's perpetuated. He's satisfied. I always think, you know, I was talking with, with my friend this morning. He's like, man, I just like to talk to God sometimes. You ever think that? I just like to talk to God. So we go about, we try to get his attention. Do you realize <laughs> He would, uh, he's been dying to talk to you. We got to do something. To get, we got to dress right. We got to get up in God's presence. We got to get right. You live in his presence. And he desires to talk to us. He desires to give of himself wholly to us. And then it says, I'm going to try to hurry. Verse 14, for, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We have talked and talked and talked about that verse. So I've got fear of death here. And you know, this fear, this fear, it haunts us. I mean, and remember, he's writing to Hebrews. Now, let me tell you something. Do you know what a Hebrew called the grave? When they buried somebody, they had a name for it. It was called hell because it was the unknown. They didn't know. They couldn't see past it. It, it was the unknown. So they called the unknown hell. Now, it was the Greeks who did all the other fantastic stuff with Dante's Inferno and Greek mythology and added all the other stuff. But to a Hebrew, it was the unknown. We don't know. We... we, we Nobody's ever come back from the dead and told us this was on the other side. It's the unknown, so we called it hell. And you can, you can look. It was, it was the grave. So now we got this great fear of the unknown. We don't know. The Sadducee says that's it. There's no resurrection. I mean, that's it. It's over. The Pharisee says, well, we know there's a resurrection, but we, we just don't know. So, you know, so this fear. And it says here that that he, he tasted death, that he destroyed him, that had the power of that. He, he tasted the unknown. He tasted the scary. He went into the scary. 
You know, sometimes we got we to gotta get her kid mind back on. He went into the sky. I'm not going in there. Uh-uh, it's dark in there. I'm not going in there. Uh-uh, I'm scared. He went in there. Then you, you, I mean, why are we afraid, truthfully? I mean, if we, we get down to it, bare bones, why are we afraid? We're afraid we're going to have to give an account for what we done. And we know we blew it. We know we had some bad days. And we're afraid I'm going to have to go give an account for that. And I know you go read Revelation 20 and with the great white throne and, and all stand before the judgment seat of God. I wish we had time to go debunk all of that stuff. But I'm telling you, if that ain't for you. You're already seated with him on the judgment seat. You're in Christ. What, so it didn't really matter what, what mattered in Revelation to us. What book are you found in? Right? There's one book called the book of life. That ain't judged nobody out of that. The others are judged out of the other books. What book are you in? What man are you in? Adam, are you in Christ? In Christ? You got no, no worries. So, we're, so you see, he went in and took the... If there's no worries, then I'm never going to have to give an account. Why? Because Jesus tasted death for every man. He's been propitiated then there's no gray area here. He made it black and white. You sin, you die. But I took your place and I died. So you don't have to worry about it. It's over. But we try to live in a gray area, emotions, thoughts. That's why he says taste and see. Taste and see what? That the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is angry. Taste and see that the Lord is going to get you. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I mean, drink it in. Drink it in every day. Drink a whole lot. You can come to this well. I mean, as a matter of fact, this well is springing up out of you. Now, let me keep reading here. Verse 60. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, like us that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. That word reconciliation, same word as propitiation. That he might make propitiation for the sins of the people. Satisfaction. For in that he himself has suffered, suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. God is not frustrated. He was made like us to be a merciful and faithful high priest. Question? I mean, we got to ask this question. Does Jesus know what he did? I mean, that's pretty stupid, eh? but we got to ask the question. Does Jesus know what he did? And we say, well, yeah, of course. That's a dumb question. Jesus knows what he did. It's not Jesus hammering me. Who is it that we say hammers me? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's convicting me, driving me into the ground, and he's, he's wearing me out. He's hammering me. Well, I've got to ask the question, does the Holy Spirit not know what Jesus did? Was he hiding out in a cave somewhere, and he didn't know what Jesus did? I mean, he's not aware of the finished work of Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit says, uh, don't worry, Jesus, I'll get him. That's what's preached in all these churches, ain't it? If the Holy Spirit is... Well, let's just see what truth says. So we got a, a kind, compassionate, forgiving Jesus and a Holy Spirit who makes you feel guilty, who makes you feel dirty, who makes you feel distant, who makes you feel like God is frowning on you. Hebrews chapter 10. New covenant here. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 12. But this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. That's all the way back in Hebrews 1, ain't it? After he had purged our sins by his own, sat down at the majesty on high. And he's bringing it up again because he's Hebrews, man. We've got to be reminded over and over and over. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Sound like we just read that in Hebrews chapter 2. For by one offering he hath perfected forever... Forever, in other words, that word propitiated, he's perfected forever them that are sanctified. We just read that over, and then he added to that that he's not ashamed to call us brethren. 
And then he says this crazy verse here. Whereof the Holy Ghost is also a witness to us. For after that he said before, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days. So the Holy Spirit is sent there bearing witness in you. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them in their sin and iniquity. I will remember no more. So it ain't the Holy Spirit, not if we believe truth, but that's who we think is always out there con busting you up as the Holy Spirit, making you feel bad. Now, and, and I told you, if you feel like you lack these things, you forgot you were purged. So every time I feel different, I feel distant, I feel dirty, i got to go back and remember again, do this in remembrance of me, I've been purged. Wait a minute. It's not the Holy Spirit doing this to me. Why is that so important? Because it's the Holy Spirit I live with. Right? I live with the Holy Spirit, so it better be right with the Holy Spirit. Well, it is. The Holy Spirit does testify. The Holy Spirit ain't on board with what Jesus did. Then, Houston, we have a problem. We got two Gospels, but we don't. The one testifies of the other. Jesus, we see that in that last verse. Not only high priest, but counselor. And he's able to, I mean, he's the best one in the whole world. He comes to our aid when we're tempted. So he's just basically saying there's no mixed messages. You can't mix the two. And this one is so great. And if you guys spend so much time, Hebrews, in the, paying attention to that, oh, how much more there is over here. So I'll quit with that. And we'll continue on this Hebrews next week. And I, I like where we're going with this Hebrews because I'm just excited about it. So we'll quit with that.